Oh, man. Well, it's such an honor to be back. Um, last weekend, um, I mentioned, hey, you know what you should do? You should, like, totally, if you know someone younger, like, invite them for coffee. Or if you know someone older, ask them for coffee. And um, I got over 50 emails from you all saying, can we, uh, can we hang out? Can we do coffee? <laughs> one guy one guy's like, snowbirding in Arizona is like, I came to your state can we get coffee? I'm like, sure, let's do it. So over the next like few weeks, like my schedule's crazy packed. I can't wait to get to know you and um, just amazing. But um, I-, I realized something recently and I was doing some research in, on, on, on Great Britain and I came to find out that 9 million people in this one little small area of Great Britain, 9 million people over the age of 65 felt profound loneliness. And and the kind of loneliness where they felt separated and disconnected from another. And and in this survey, they said that these 9 million people had gone a month without any significant conversation or feeling seen, known, loved, or that they belonged. And the same thing began to happen when they began to research millennials and boomers Gen Xers, and they began to recognize that there was this epidemic of loneliness, feeling separated and disconnected from another. And one of the, the researchers said that loneliness is worse than smoking 15 cigarettes a day to your emotional and mental psyche. And so this is what the UK did. Brilliant. So this is what the parliament did. They created a new position. It's called the Minister of Loneliness. No joke. Imagine if they put that on your LinkedIn title. And this woman's name is Tracy Crouch. She's 42 years old, and she has stepped in. Now, if I ever saw her, I wouldn't want to talk to her because everyone would assume that I was lonely. But, like, this, this is what her whole issue is, is trying to solve this issue of loneliness. But here's what really got me. Is that they did research and they found that because of loneliness, that businesses in Great Britain lost $3.6 billion per year. $3.6 billion per year due to the mental and emotional effects caused by loneliness. People not feeling like they could trust a a coworker, people not showing up to work because of just the struggles and, and literally isolation and what that was doing for team morale. And all of a sudden, this became such an important problem for like the gross national product of Great Britain that they had to create this position, which got me thinking. 3.5, 3.6 billion dollars per year for Great Britain. What is the kingdom currency? What are the effects of loneliness in the local church? What kind of, what kind of results of loneliness is having its kind of play to disconnect and, and help people feel separate from one another? And, and you might be sitting here going, eh, see, that's just Great Britain. I'm telling you, it's not. It's here in the U.S. And even in Indianapolis, it ranks as the 21st most lonely city in the United States of America. Chicago, behind you. Philadelphia, behind you. Houston, behind you. Dallas, behind you. New York City, behind you. And I'm telling you what. The area in which we are like, you all live in, many people are struggling with the profound ache and pain of feeling separate and disconnected from one another. Which leads me to an email that I got. A guy wrote me from Northview and he said, hey man, um, your message last week didn't feel like you. Which I responded, tell me more. And he said, every time you teach at Northview, you talk about vines and trees. And you had no trees. And so for you at Comcast.com, this is for you. Now, um, I want to tell you, one of my favorite cities in the planet is Santa Cruz, California. It's a quirky city. It's on the coast. And like you can surf. And there's this place called The Hook that leads into Steamer Lane. Amazing, amazing waves. But then you drive a mile up from the beach... And you are at John Muir Redwood Forest. And I don't know about you, if you've ever been around the Redwoods, they're incredible. I mean, you just, you just stand and you're like 300 
170, 410 feet tall. I mean, you are standing, looking up. And these, these redwoods, they grow 10 feet a day. And they're, what they're literally trying to do is chase the sun, chase the light. And they just grow and they grow and they grow. What's amazing is about redwoods is that they drink fog. They grow. And in Santa Cruz, because of all of that fog that comes off the coast, these trees are growing and their leaves are able to drink its fog. At the trunk of a redwood, there is 8,000 gallons of water. I mean, you talk about a savings account. Whenever a drought comes and California is known to have them, redwoods have an amazing savings account. But the crazy piece is, is when you walk in a redwood forest, it's so quiet. Because the bark absorbs sound. All of the noise, it just absorbs it. And you're walking and you hear the sounds of birds chirping. Or you hear the sounds of the waterfalls. And it just feels so serene and sacred. What's amazing too is about the bark of a redwood. Did you know that redwoods are fire resistant? There could be a, a, a wildfire burning through California. It comes into the redwoods. And literally, there is a resin that's within this bark that is in fire extinguishers to put out fires. Redwoods don't struggle from disease. A lot of Midwest trees right now have been hurt by these beetles. And they're literally just attacking trees. They literally can't bite through this bark. And they just move on. So it's fire resistant. It's disease resistant. It absorbs the noise. It's like creates this serene ability. It, it, it can survive literally through drought. It actually can survive through flooding. I mean, these redwoods are unbelievable. If, if there's someone who loves construction, every builder will tell you, cedar and redwood, the best kind of wood. But what's so amazing to me about redwoods as you think a tree that is 370, 410 feet tall, you'd think their roots would go down a couple hundred feet. But they only go down 9 to 12 feet. But what's amazing is they go out 100 feet, out 100 feet. And they find other redwoods and they literally interlock with one another. And scientists have been studying redwoods recently, and they began to recognize that redwoods are growing, 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 trying to chase the light, drink the fog, and then all of a sudden, they realize that one of their redwoods in their family are sick. So a signal goes out, and all the redwoods stop kind of growing and chasing the light, and they send nutrients and water to that sick redwood tree see in the uk people don't talk to each other but in santa cruz california redwoods talk to each other and what's so amazing to me is these scientists are recognizing that oh my goodness these redwoods are communicating because they are interlocked with one another a couple hundred years ago in this scientific journal in the uk this one woman wrote that like when you planted a redwood by itself the roots only went nine to 10 feet. So when the winds came or the storms came, it just toppled over. But then they said, funny thing. When you literally plant them with more redwoods, they can endure any storm. And what's amazing to me is I think that there are many of us that are trying to do this life alone. And the storms are coming. And we're facing these, these battles we're facing this struggle, we're facing trauma, we're facing these difficult days, and we're just getting just toppled and trampled on. And I think that there's something so powerful about Redwoods is they're a picture to me of what the church, the local church is supposed to be. See, in, in the New Testament, you'll see a word that's used again and again and again, and it's the word alelon, A-L-L-E-L-O-N. And it's, it's where we get this phrase, one another. Jesus will tell us in John 13 to love Alelan, love one another. You'll see Paul writing that we ought to honor one another. Peter says, respect each other. Respect one another. You'll see James talking about pray for one another. 
You'll see this word again and again. Confess with one another. Even in the Bible, it tells you which NFL team you should root for when it says in Colossians to bear with one another. (laughs) And this is what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to have all of these one another's in our life that our lives ought to be so interconnected. That we should be like kind of the antidote for loneliness. That we should be this forest. I love what Andy Stanley says, is that the primary purpose of the local church is one anothering one another. And we ought to embody this. And when you get to the book of 2 Timothy, it is one of the clearest, most practical examples of how to one another, one another. So in 2 Timothy, chapter one, it says this, for this reason, remember Paul's writing to his like spiritual son, his mentee, his apprentice, his Talmudine disciple, Timothy. And he says, for this reason, I remind you, Timothy, to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, I want you to see something. What Paul is telling Timothy is like, hey, I want to remind you of something. I want you to never forget this moment. Because if you're like me, it's really, really easy to forget the things you ought to remember and to remember the things you ought to forget. And what's so powerful to me is that Paul is saying, hey, Timothy, in this moment, a whole bunch of people laid hands on you. They gave you and they told you your spiritual gift. He goes, I want to remind you, but here, you've got a responsibility. And your responsibility is to fan that gift into flame. Your responsibility is to keep that gift white hot. And for some of us in this room, we don't know our spiritual gift. For some of us in this room, if we're really, really honest, we haven't even worked on our spiritual gift for years. And Paul, I think, would tell every one of us, hey, can I remind you? God didn't just save you. God didn't just rescue you. God didn't just redeem you. God didn't just give you eternity because of what his son did. He also gave you a spiritual gift. So what are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? I I love as I travel, I'm coming to realize that every culture, every region of the U.S. has some amazing parts about it. And then every place just has some oddities. Some kind of peculiar parts to it. I would tell you this about Chicago, one of my favorite cities in the world, that it happens to be, in my opinion, one of the most passive aggressive cities. I remember I would be teaching, I'd get done with the teach, and someone would stop me and say, Hey, great sermon. Which I would start to say, Thank you. But before I could say, Thank you, that person would just look at me and say, You've gotten so much better since when you first began. <laughs> which I'm like, Okay, thanks. And the person behind them says, hey, Steve, I just want to tell you, that was a great message. And right before I'm about to say thank you, they go, when you first began, I didn't know if I liked you, but you're growing on me. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that. Why can't you just give an encouraging word and walk away? Why do you have to just passively, aggressively attack my soul? And so I started thinking about this. And one day I'm like flipping through the scriptures and I come across what Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy. And he says, command and teach these things. And a verse that many of us are familiar if we ever went to youth group. Don't let anyone look down on you because you were young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. But this is where we usually stop. But I want you to see what Paul wants Timothy to hold on to. He says, until I come... Devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift. Do not stop working at your craft and your character. Do not stop. Never neglect your gift, which was given to you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. And hear this. Oh man, it gets good. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them. So that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So I found myself standing in line. And people came up to me and said, man, you've gotten so much better. 
And I began to recognize, thanks be to God. Because in a way, I hope in five years, I'm a better preacher and teacher and pastor than I am today. And I hope in 15 years, I'm a better preacher and teacher and pastor than I was five years earlier. And here's what I need you to understand. Many of you in this room, I think you might have neglected your gift. I think it might be something where you once were using it, but somehow life, somehow other things just got in the way, and that spiritual gift is just kind of collecting a little bit of dust. And I hope for every one of us, we would hear the words of Paul, this rabbi speaking to his disciple. You'd hear these words from my mouth, and you'd hear my heart saying, please, discover your gift. Please, don't neglect your gift. And please, use your gift and let people see you get better over time. For some of you, you might be sitting here and go like, oh, how do I learn about the gifts? I want to tell you that in the book of Corinthians and Romans, it kind of details what some of the gifts are. Romans says this, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members or parts do not all have the same function, so in Christ, though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. This is like saying like, we literally belong to one another. We are like connected, interlocked with one another. Continues on. We have different spiritual gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophecy, it's like ability to see the future and see tomorrow and like allow people to get caught up in that vision, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. You all know what encouragement is. It's literally seeing the image of God in someone and calling it out and pointing them to who they were created to be. And in doing that, you're giving them the courage to become who they were meant to be. If it's giving, then give generously. Some of you in this room, you know how to make a lot of money. You have that gift. And yet, you have this ability to literally give and bless others. And when you do it, somehow you feel the thrill of God using you. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Do you know your gift? Have you neglected your gift? Are you putting your gift into practice and are people seeing you get better at your gift? And if you don't know what your gift is, let me just tell you, every spiritual gift leads people to Jesus. If you have the gift of leadership, what is that? That means you take the values of heaven and you literally lead people to experience if Christ, if Jesus was leading your family, leading your business, leading on your team. See, every spiritual gift points people to Jesus. Uh, if you have the gift of mercy, what is that? You're the hands and feet of Jesus wherever you go. If you have the gift of like hospitality, you are creating safe and secure environments, whether at your home, whether in, your, in the marketplace, whether in your school, so that what? So that people can experience Jesus. If you have the gift of administration, there is a special place in heaven for you. That means in a world of chaos, you bring order and you help focus everyone on their tasks so that more and more people can experience who? Jesus. Every spiritual gift leads to Jesus and we must find it. We must discover it. We must never neglect it. And we must be putting it into practice so that as one body, we are stronger for his glory. Now, if you don't know your spiritual gift, can I tell you? There's this amazing course on February 29th at all of our campuses. We're doing this. It's called SHAPE. And literally, S, it's an acronym, and S stands for spiritual gift. H is your heart. A is your abilities. P is your personality. E is your experience. And when we put all of that together, you're going to see how you are wired. And, and you're going to learn about your spiritual gifts and opportunities for you to kind of deploy those gifts. And all you need to do is you can take out your phone if you want to learn more. You can text NEXT to 867-5309. You just text 867-5309 and Jenny will respond. No, it's 85379. But here's, here's what I want. Please. 
please do not miss this. Because if you miss this, what ends up suffering is we all suffer. Because we belong to each other. We belong to each other. But we go back to that 2 Timothy passage. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I read the scriptures. And when I'm reading it, there's, I see something that I, I'm like, what does that really mean? What do they really look like? And Paul says, hey, fan in the flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Like, like what? What does this mean? And, and if, you, if you're familiar with the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament, and you know that a father would give a blessing to a son or a daughter. And the parents would just kind of, kind of come around and, and they would speak these words of truth. They, they kind of give them a picture of where their life was going. And Paul, remember, he saw himself as Timothy's spiritual father. And he saw Timothy as his spiritual son. And he, and he just had this moment one day where he wanted to call out those gifts. I just want to show you just what this could look like. Maybe in your home. What this could look like in your small group. What this could look like with one of your kids or grandkids. I'm going to invite um, Matt Seward to come on stage. You, know, you, all, you all love Matt. Uh, there's a tall drink of water right there. Just have a seat. I didn't give him a microphone, so he just has to take this. Um, in the first two services, I held back. I held back because I love this guy and um, I can't look at him right now but for two years I've gotten to know him and before I ever knew him I knew of his mom his mom's Lynn Seward she's an amazing woman Have you ever heard her sing <sighs> bring you to your knees and truth be told uh, I've been to these funerals and the person that they would want to sing was his mom and she would just sing these songs. And then I find myself coming to Northview. And, and one day this guy walks up and goes, oh, you might know my mom. It's Lynn Seward. And I was like, what? And I found myself just getting to know this guy. And I don't know what you think of him. Six foot 11. <laughs> plays a kitty guitar. But I'll tell you who this guy is. And I'm not in any way, please, 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 please. I'm not in any way trying to be a spiritual father. I'm not in any way trying to, to, to pretend I'm anyone in this man's life but a friend. But I want you to see something. Because in all of my years, I've never heard someone say, whatever you do, do not bless me. I've never heard a kid say, dad, do not speak those words of love and truth about who you think I am. I've never heard that. I've never heard a daughter say, stop, stop affirming who God made me to be. I've never heard that. And I, tr truth be told, as parents, we've been taught to be protectors and providers, but I want you to know, when you look at this book, it also says that you are pastors and prophets. Your job isn't just to protect and provide for them, but your job is to help give them a, a map to kind of navigate through the complexities of culture. But then there's a prophetic side where you literally can lay a hand and give a blessing and call out the good. And I, I imagine that Timothy, just like many of us, was going through a season where he just doubted himself. I'm a mamzer, like I talked about last week. I have nothing to offer. And Paul one day said, you know what, forget that. You come up here, you have a seat. He gathers some elders around. And what do they do? They lay hands. And they start by just being quiet. This is what they would do. They would just be quiet and they would listen to the spirit. They would listen to God. And they would simply say, God, what do you want me to say? I don't know about you, but if you've got a grandchild, don't ever waste those words. Don't ever waste these moments and go, I don't know. Have those moments where you can say, I've been thinking. Maybe for some of you, you got to write it in a letter. Don't write it in a text because it only has to be nine words. But like, write it out. But can I just tell you who I think this guy is? He's humble. Yesterday, I walked in. I was getting my mic and... 
I came in and I saw all of these artists and worship pastors and the sound team and, the, and, the, and all of the people who are underneath that run this service and they're all up on the stage. And as I was walking down this aisle right here, I looked <laughs> and I saw this guy on his knees and he was just praying. And you never see this and he hates this. That's why he doesn't have a mic right now. He says to take it and I like it. And, <laughs> and what he kept saying was, I pray that Northview would have a perspective. They would never lose that eternal hope. They would never lose it. I don't know him too well. But I also know that he hasn't had the easiest life. And I know he doesn't just say those words. But you believe them. And you've seen God give you and restore what the locust had stolen. And you lead with an integrity. And you lead. Oh man, I'm losing it right now. Sorry. Um, with the humility. And I just see Jesus all over your life all over your marriage and the way that you love your bride. You were a gift to this community and you were a gift to me. Now get off stage. <laughs> uh, uh. I mean, can you just imagine if we did that for our kids? Can you just imagine if we did that for our grandkids? Can you imagine if we did that for one another? Would people feel alone? Would they feel separate? Would they feel disconnected? And sometimes we hold those words like, I don't know how to say it. I don't know how to do that. But I believe everything I said. You go back to this verse and it's so amazing because he's like, hey, it's your responsibility, man. You got to fan into flame that gift which is in you through the laying on of my hands. I believe what I spoke into your life, Timothy. Now, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid. No more timid Timothy. No more timidity, Timothy. Because I need you to understand that the spirit God gave you was of power, love, and self-discipline. I mean, when you just think about this, what Paul is saying to this guy is I know everything in you wants you to go backwards in your story and you're allowing those lies to reign supreme and it's holding your life in check until you honor a new truth. And here's the new truth. That God did not make you to be timid. But God gave you power. God gave you love. God gave you self-discipline. And in Greek, it's these words, dunameos. If you turn that U to a Y, it's where you get the word dynamite. God gave you a power that is dynamic. It's not human like kind of mustard. This is of God. And if you've ever experienced the thrill of God using you and your spiritual gift, and you have this moment, and you literally are like, I'm not that good. There's a God at work. I've seen this with people who have the gift of prayer, and they're literally seeing things, and they are praying for things, and, and I'm literally like, there is something in which God is using and blessing and enlarging that gift. I've seen it with like people who have that gift of mercy, and they're literally like in, a, in, a, in one of the most difficult situations, just to sit by someone's bedside, whether they pass or whether they're hurting, and just bring comfort. And you realize someone's not that good, but they have this dynamic power from heaven. But I love what it says. It's like, you've got this dynamite, but I'm also calling you to unconditional love, to agape. And we've probably all seen people who, who've had power that was like misused. And they forgot that this has always ever been about God's love. And I love how Paul says this. He's like, man, this is what it's about. It's power and love. It's these two together. And they feel opposite, but no, 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 no. It's like you are so connected to the gift that God's given to you. And you are so connected to the love that he bestowed upon you. And you recognize it's all a gift. 
It's a gift of my very breath. It's a gift of eternity. It's a gift of Christ rescuing me. And that gives me power that I have been rescued. That gives me power that I've been forgiven. That gives me power that I've been gifted. And I got to give that away. But then it like, then he throws this other word, sophronismu. And again, if you don't know how to say a word publicly, just say it quickly and with authority and move on. <laughs> but he uses this word, self-discipline. Like why, why, why would he do that? Like literally, why, why would he do that? Why would he talk about power and love? Oh yeah, yeah, and self-discipline. And, and I get it, I get it. Kobe Bryant, complex figure. But if you've ever studied Kobe's commitment to the game of basketball, or let's talk Indiana, Larry Legend, I'll tell you what, out of, out of all of the players in the NBA, those two guys were gifted supernaturally, but those two didn't waste an ounce of their gifting because of their commitment and their self-discipline and their love for the game. And when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look what Paul says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And hear this. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I don't know about you, but that gets me up in the morning. I know, I know. Some people walk up to me and they're like, Steve, do you drink Red Bull before you preach? Got your hair, you look like a poor man's Joel Osteen. What are you doing? And here's the thing. Here's the thing. At the end of my life, I don't want to get to the, the end of my story. And I don't want to stand before a holy God. I don't want God to say, Steve, you neglected your gift. You never discovered your gift. You didn't honor the gift that I gave you. And I read this passage like I don't want to be disqualified because I just allowed a gift from God. Another fuller extension on grace from God to go to waste. And I guarantee you someone sitting here going, Steve, that sounds like works. I kid you not, it has nothing to do with works. And Dallas Willard says this, grace is opposed to earning, but grace is never opposed to effort. And when Paul says power, love, and the self-discipline, it is our responsibility to fan those gifts into flame, to know our gifts, to discover them, to deploy them, and do it in such a way that people can see that we're getting better, getting deeper, and keeping that remain thing the main thing. But I'm thinking about this, and I keep thinking about those redwoods. This one moment when I was in Santa Cruz, I don't know if you've ever had this experience being in Redwoods, and I just kind of walked in the center, and I was just looking at all of these Redwoods around me, just, I just felt like I was inside the center of this circle, and I was with this, this guide, and I was asking him a whole bunch of questions, and I'm such a teacher, and I, I get so curious, I'm like a two-year-old, and I'm just peppering this poor guy with questions, and, and finally I'm like... Dude, how does this happen? How do these like just grow in a perfect circle? And the guy's like, well, good question. And like literally this is what happens. One redwood tree falls. And when it falls, its seeds kind of get spread. But because its roots are interlocked and interconnected together, all of the other redwoods around it want to keep sending it nutrients. And then what ends up happening is they send nutrients and then new life begins to grow out of this fallen tree. And it begins to kind of spread out. And then fast forward a number of years, you have this family of trees that are growing around this tree that was once dead, but is now alive. And I, I literally was like, and he looks at me and goes, what, what does that make you think? 
And I'm like, you know what what that makes me think? It's the gospel. (laughs) And he's like, what? And I'm like, I'm so sorry. You're science, dude. I'm a preacher. We can, we can hang out together. But let me just tell you, I believe in this story where there was this one man who lived this perfect life. And then on one Friday, they called it good. I still don't fully understand it. But he dies. And he hangs on a tree and he is dead. And he takes all of our brokenness, all of our pain, all of our trauma, all of our abuse, all the things that we have done unto ourselves and unto others. He took it on the cross And everybody thought he was dead. But heaven was just getting started. And all of a sudden, the resurrection power from heaven began to come into this man. And on Easter Sunday, almost 2,000 years later, he wakes up. And he is alive. And now, and now, what's amazing is we now call ourselves as this family that's in Christ. And we have like circled our stories and our lives and our gifts around Christ. How you like them apples? And this guy like is just like looking at me. And he's like, he's like, that's that's fascinating. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, do you know what scientists call this? And he's pointing up. And I was like, no. He's like, we call it a cathedral. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Because when you're there, it's as if like you're standing in holy ground, which has gotten me thinking. And here's what I'd love for you to do. I'd love for you all to stand. Now everyone's like, what are we going to do? I want you to grab the hand of the person beside you. And if there's aisles, I want you to cut across. And, and seriously, don't be weird. All right. <laughs> like if some of you are like, I was hoping I was going to get a hold of her hands. Like. Don't, don't be like, oh man, I was reading the book of numbers this morning. What's yours? Like, don't, don't be that person. Okay. (laughs) Don't be that person. Stay with me. We're in church. Here's what I want you to see. Here's what I want you to see. I just started thinking about this. One tree that fell. Heaven just getting started. New life. And then I just started thinking about all the people in the greater Indianapolis area who don't have this, who feel separated, disconnected. They don't know where their gift plays into the larger story. And I'm like, God created nature. And nature is like this beautiful example of what the church is supposed to be. I want you to feel the hand of the person beside you. Don't squeeze it too hard, but I want you to feel... And just, just, just hear these verses. We are called to be devoted to one another. We are called to spur a leilon one another on. We're called to pray for one another. We're called to confess to one another. We're called to honor one another. We're called to forgive one another. We're called to love one another. We are called to one another. For we belong to one another. And I just sat here. I said, man, if the local church could ever get this right, as people enter in, and if this is your first time, I'm sorry, we don't always hold hands like this, but but if like you walked in, I think you would begin to say, there is something different about this place. In a world where I feel alone and separate and disconnected, now I feel like I have a place and I belong. And they would say something like something is different. And in scientific language, they would say, well, it looks like a cathedral. What if we, Northview, could be more like Redwoods? And when one of our friends and brothers and parts are just feeling sick... We can give love, give grace, give peace, give truth. And when one of our friends just needs to be encouraged and motivated, we can just spur them on and we can give them honor. We can call out the best in them. Why? Because we belong to each other. And when we do this, we will not only be a holy cathedral, but we will be a compelling force in Redwood Forest for kingdom good. Amen? Amen. You may have.